welcome to a brand new episode of the podcast entitled Couch Potatoes Unite! Exclamation point. This is a podcast based on a blog of the same name because we're the main characters in our own stories too. My name is Kylie and I love TV. If you feel the same, keep listening and or checking out the blog at couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com as you're bound to find some common ground or something you like. For Couch Potatoes Unite, we're all about the wonders and unique long-form storytelling of the small screen. CPU wishes you rest from the heat, whatever heat that might be, and hopes you've been following releases of brand new episodes of the podcast on Wednesdays, as well as new blog entries on some Tuesdays, and as always, we have several more new episodes on the way. Because the panels and I live lives behind our podcast, the episode Episodes are published once per week. Subscribe to the blog or the podcast via iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and via Google Play to stay on top of brand new episodes. Episodes already published discuss a variety of shows around the water cooler, including but not limited to Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, Grimm, American Horror Story, How to Get Away with Murder, Gotham, Once Upon a Time, Supernatural, and the Marvel's Netflix series, including Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist. We've published several episodes in our Looking Back series, covering such diverse shows as Third Rock from the Sun, Person of Interest, Glee, That 70s Show, and Gallivant. Plus, new episodes are in the works, including revisits for New Girl, The 100, Doctor Who, Orange is the New Black, The Originals, and the DCTU series panel, covering Arrow, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, and Supergirl, with an episode for each show. A final visit with our broad church panel to say goodbye to the mystery drama from across the pond we'll be launching a new panel covering lemony snicket's unfortunate events and one covering sense eight which is getting a finale episode later so we're no longer looking back at it and our buffy first panel will continue the five-part series covering buffy the vampire slayer and angel what's more cpu is going live again we've been planning some live events as i've repeatedly been alluding to in these introductions and we're super excited about them if you can believe it cpu is coming up on our one hundredth episode. We're ready for syndication, baby. Just kidding. What we're not kidding about, however, is that we have a special live event coming up on October 2nd to celebrate that 100th episode, which will, in the spirit of live events, actually be in front of a live studio audience. We also have more live appearances and other cool stuff being planned, so make sure you like us at our Facebook page, our Twitter, follow us at CPU Podcast, our Instagram at Couch Potatoes Unite, and or our Pinterest at CPU Podcast, or subscribe to the blog, our YouTube channel, our iTunes channel, our Stitcher Radio channel, or find us on Google Play. In the meantime, if you don't hear a show in this podcast format, fellow panelists and I still write reviews and we're always seeking new panelists. So if you have any interest in joining the discussion, say hello by finding us at any of those outlets I've mentioned. At the very least, stop by and leave us a thumbs up, comment, or review. We like feedback. Though if you're trolling with sexist overtones, we might have to give you what's coming to you. Yeah. Today's panel is looking back at an American action drama and comic book adaptation created and written by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. If you aren't already aware, from time to time, CPU will be choosing shows of all types, but usually of some fame or notoriety to reminisce about, and to consider whether or not they age gracefully, like Peggy Carter herself, or don't hold up as well, like Whitney Frost, infected by too much zero matter. As such, this is another chapter of our Looking Back podcast episodes, wherein we review a show that has been gone, either by a natural end or cancellation for some time. And today, that show is Marvel's Agent Carter, which aired on ABC for two low-rated seasons from 2015 to 2016. Agent Carter was ultimately canceled by the Alphabet Network on May 12, 2016. The series features the Marvel Comics character Peggy Carter, with Haley Atwell reprising her role from the Captain America film series, as she must balance life as a secret agent with that of a single woman in 1940s America. The series introduces the origins of several characters and storylines from MCU films, while other characters from the films also appear. The first season, consisting of eight episodes, originally aired from January 6 to February 24, 2015, while the second season, consisting of 10 episodes, originally aired from January 19 to March 1, 2016. The first season takes place in 1946, with Peggy Carter having to balance the routine office work she does for the Strategic Scientific Reserve, or SSR, in New York City, with secretly assisting Howard Stark, who finds himself framed for supplying deadly weapons to enemies of the United States. Carter is assisted by Stark's butler, Edwin Jarvis, played by James Darcy, to find those responsible and dispose of the weapons. In the second season, Carter moves from New York City to Los Angeles to deal with the threats of the new atomic age by the secret empire and the aftermath of World War II, 
gaining new friends, a new home, and a potential new love interest. Today, for CPU's look back at Agent Carter, we've gathered a heroic panel of strong women, all familiar voices ready to kick ass and take names as we digest the brief but powerful Agent Carter, whose following is small but loyal. It should be noted, though, that all of our panelists have viewed the entire series and made discuss sensitive plot points, so for those of you who haven't watched any of Agent Carter, listen at your own risk as there may be major spoilers. At this time, what I'm going to have the panel do is introduce themselves. They should know the drill. Those who are CPU loyal should know the drill. But I'm going to remind everybody that this is how it works. What I'd like you to do is tell us what your first name is, just your first name, nothing else, and how you came to watch Agent Carter. What made you start watching? How did you find out about it? What kept you watching? And then, oh, did you watch all of it? That's important because we're looking back. And then what I'd like you to do is rate your interest in the show. And, of course, we're going to be using the standard CPU character question that changes with each show we do. And also, because we're looking back, what I need you to do is think about what your interest in the show was at the beginning of the series when you first started watching it and what your interest was at the end of the series when you finished watching it. Are you ready, panel? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. And there were only a few regular characters on this show, so I didn't go into all of the possible recurring characters. We certainly can talk about them. But in the character question, it goes like this. Did you watch it? Because though you wouldn't want to make a big deal about it, you felt a duty to watch it after the time you spent with Captain America, the first Avenger. Still, you loved it, quite emphatically, in spite of yourself. You craved the excitement, the adventure, and the camaraderie, and there are so few good, strong, lead female characters and or heroes out there. Of course you had to support it, quietly and proudly, like Agent Margaret Peggy Carter. You initially watched it because your friends watched it, but you grew to truly love the adventure and excitement. It gave you a sense of purpose, beyond being a butler, and Howard Stark's butler at that, that is, like Edwin Jarvis. You secretly loved it, even adored it. It impressed you, and you learned not to underestimate this show or the show's main character, even though you were aware that the show, main character included, was not without its flaws, like Daniel Souza. You weren't sure about it for a long time. You begrudgingly came to accept it, even like it in the end, though not without a due sense of weariness. You didn't know how long a show with the Asian Carter character could sustain when it was really a tale about a woman in a so-called man's profession surviving and thriving at a time when women weren't allowed to be secret agents, like Jack Thompson. Or you watched the first season and then stopped watching, or stopped watching altogether, regardless of when, because you couldn't get into it completely or couldn't bring yourself to watch more than a few episodes, or because, spoiler, you died like Roger Dooley, the former chief. Who would like to start? Hi, I'm Celine. Hi, Celine. Hi. How oh, I came to yes. watch Agent Carter. I was a huge fan of Bridget Regan prior to the show, thanks to Legend of the Seeker. And <laughs> I found out she was going to be in a show with Agent Carter. And I mean, who didn't love Peggy in Captain America? And it was just like, women, I love them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those two in particular, not just women, women, but... And I was like, done. Let's be honest. I'm so <laughs> <bad>. <laughs> And I was like, I must watch it. But then I didn't end up actually watching it until after the season had already aired. And, it, like, I'm not going to lie. I live on Tumblr. You know, <laughs> Angie and Peggy were all over my Tumblr. So I was like, all right, I'm not... Yes, of course I'll watch this. And then I ended up buying it before I watched it, just because it was easier that way, since I couldn't find it anywhere. A and problem I'm... that reigns to this day. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. And I bought that for myself on Christmas. And finished it by New Year's. <laughs> so it was a, I mean, it's only eight episodes. It was a quick watch and I loved it and I was just obsessed. As for what character I was in the beginning, I was a Dan, Daniel Souza. It's weird saying his first name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was a Souza. By the end of the show, I was a little bit more of a Carter. I, it was a little less of a, I am thoroughly in love with it, and it was a little bit more of a, I'm sticking with it for many reasons, mostly because it's a female show, and there are a lot of parts I loved about it, but there's a little bit more of a begrudging, like, I'll deal with your flaws, I'll work with you for what you were for the first season, but I still loved it, just not as much as I did in the first season. Well, welcome back, Celine. You might have heard Celine's voice on our 100 panel, as well as our person of interest looking back. This is Samantha. Hi, Samantha. Hello. I absolutely 
love and am a super nerd about all of the new Marvel movies. So when I heard this was coming out, I was so, so excited. Watched it on the first night, not even DVR'd it. I watched it live. That's how geeked I was. So in the beginning, I was a Peggy. So it's all about it. In the middle of the first season, it started to falter for me, and I had to kind of begrudgingly force myself <laughs> to watch it and keep going because I'm like, no, it's Marvel. It, it has to get better. They're just having a rough patch. So I'd be probably between a Jack and a Roger by the end of the first season, and I wasn't sure that I was going to come back for a second, but I liked the move out to California. It sort of refreshed it for me. So by the second season and the end, I was more of a Daniel. Wow, you ran the gamut. <laughs> I had seasons, too. <laughs> Well, welcome back, Samantha. You may have heard Samantha's voice on our Gilmore Girls Life series. And I guess that leaves me. Sure does. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kristen. Hi, Kristen. Hello. <laughs> so, I had been meaning to watch Agent Carter since it came out back in 2015, but I was busy. Likely story. <laughs> I was very busy, and I never was able to watch the first season and then subsequently I never watched the second season because I didn't have access to the first. But I really wanted to watch it, and when Kylie was talking about making this panel, I immediately jumped on board, and being busy, I only watched this series as of two days ago. <laughs> um, I binged all 18 episodes over the past two days prior to this recording, so it is very fresh. Awesome. So I'm happy I finally was able to watch it. It was very difficult to find. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and so my interest in the show from beginning to end is going to be a little different because I watched it in 48 hours. I really, when I first started, or the reason I wanted to watch it initially, it was because a lot of my friends were watching it because we were, we are, we still are, big Marvel fans, and I really liked the character of Peggy in the Captain America movie, and I was really excited that she was going to get her own spinoff. By the very end, I would say I'm a combination of Sousa, Captain Sousa, or Susan, as he was lovingly called, <laughs> or not so lovingly. I really liked it. It, in, it impressed me, even though it did have some flaws, but I also, I loved the excitement and the adventure, and that's what kept me watching it over the past two days. But I also, I'm a really big fan of Alias that was on ABC in the early 2000s, and so any spy adventure series with a strong female lead, I'm here for. So this kind of filled that Alias void for me since that show also went off the air. So can I clarify something? I'm not sure I quite got who your beginning character was. My beginning character was, sorry, that was Edwin Jarvis. Okay, got it. Yeah, it started as Edwin Jarvis, and then I ended as Sousa and Agent Carter. All right, fair enough. Well, welcome back, Kristen. And if you listen to CPU, chances are you've heard Kristen's voice almost as much as you've heard mine. <laughs> almost. She's almost. She's been on quite a few. She's moderated quite a few. Yay, Kristen. And as you know, my name is Kylie, and I started watching Agent Carter. I'll be moderating, by the way, today, as if you didn't already know, and participating. I started watching Agent Carter. I put it on my pickup list for CPU and for myself because, well, just to give you the speech, if you know me or you follow the blog or you've heard me give the speech before, you know that I like to see what's coming out in the fall. And I knew Agent Carter was coming out. It was about that time when I had started to catch up on the Marvel movies. The only one that I had really seen for the longest time was the first Captain America movie. So it was kind of fortuitous because Agent Carter came out, and I really did like the Peggy Carter character quite a bit from Captain America. And it was always one of my, ah, Peggy, when he went forward in the future and became an Avenger, I was like, what happened to her? Oh no, that's so sad. They were romantic and in love, and now she's left behind in the 1940s. What happened to her? So I was eager to see what that story might pan out to, and started to watch it. It took me a long time to finish it, partially because its availability is so sparse, and I had to go seeking it out, but part of it because there was some and downs with the series, which Samantha kind of pointed out when she was describing it. I would say that all throughout the series, beginning and end, I would be a Sousa. I did secretly love it and adore it. I loved a lot of things about this show. The visual presentation particularly and just all of the details, the art direction, the costuming, the cinematography, everything to make it feel like we were watching an old movie but in vivid technicolor, if you will, 
just sort of enamored me to the show, but at the same time, there were plot drags, especially in the middle of the first season and in the middle of the second season, that I struggled through a little bit and had to kind of convince myself to keep going. So I do love it. It impressed me in some ways, but also I do think it's flawed in some ways. And we're going to get into that as we talk about Agent Carter today. But because, now this is one of those strange hybrid shows where we're looking back at it, but we're also taking a first look at it. So I also have the CPU standard rating scale, standard because we always use it, I guess. <laughs> this one actually does stay the same. What I would like everyone on the panel to do is, as I go around the water cooler, have you all rate Agent Carter according to this rating scale, which goes like this. How would you rate the show overall? You can rate it however you want to quantify it in your brain or your mind. Would you rate it five stars? You have to watch everything or you did watch everything. You just had to get through all two seasons. Holy smokes. It's just the greatest show ever. You can't believe it turned out so well. Agent Carter is the awesomest. It's four stars. It seemed intriguing for a time and you kept watching, but there were pitfalls that you experienced all throughout. Was it three stars? You're going to give a well, you're not going to give it one more try, but you had to, like, struggle through things. <laughs> there were things you liked and things you didn't like, and you just were basically in it to see which things were allowed to flourish, the ones you liked or the ones you didn't like. Was it two stars? Maybe you only watched part of it, or you watched it, but quite begrudgingly. Chances are you were mainly bored, but there was some intrigue or fascination that held it together, and you kept watching, no matter how unlikely this holding it together seemed to you. Or was it one star? Even though you may have watched it because you're on this panel, you're going to say, pass on this one, guys. It's a snoozer. It's not funny. It's not interesting. It's not your cup of tea. It's the most boringest thing in the history of the world. Agent Carter, bad one star. Who would like to start the ratings? Okay, uh, I'll start. Okay, I'll Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, glad you worked that out. Uh, yeah, we're, we're good. <laughs> I'm going to give this one... I'm going to say a solid four. Okay. I agree with some things that Samantha had said earlier, too, where there was a little bit in season one where it kind of started to drag, and then there was also part of the storyline in season two got real kind of more sci-fi than I was expecting, and so it would have been interesting to see where they would have gone with the season three, but maybe ending it after two was a solid idea, so solid four stars. Okay. Definitely worth a watch. Okay. Kristen says four. I would give it three and a half, mostly because I can't decide between three or four. And I, I just don't know if it's because it was on a network show and ABC really didn't give it any favors in terms of scheduling that I think it would have probably done better on streaming like a Netflix or a Hulu that doesn't have all the interruptions because I think I could have gotten over some of those stumbling blocks a bit better had it not been an episode here, an episode there, and taking time off. I would give it a four. I agree with Kristen a lot. I, there's just a lot of things I loved about it, and there were pitfalls, definitely, and I think a lot of those pitfalls came in, in pacing. Like, I think the downtime in the middle of the seasons could have been prevented had they just shifted some of the later episodes, which were so jam-packed, a little bit earlier on, or just figured out better pacing. But I give it a solid four, and I would recommend. I recommend it to everybody. I'm like, you should watch Agent Carter, and then they're like, how? And I'm like, come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> I have no season two. I, I like. I, I honestly think that I had a lot of problems with season two because I couldn't watch it on television, so I had to catch up on it El Tau, and there was a lot of problems with trying to do it El Tau. Like a lot of there just was not an easy way to find mm -hmm. it. Whenever, you know, I try to watch it, I couldn't, and then it would put me off for a while, and I'd be like, oh yeah, I want to go try and watch that again, let's see if I can get an episode to work. But four. <laughs> Sorry, that was a tirade that wasn't necessary to my rating. <laughs> it's fine, Celine. I expect nothing less. <laughs> She's a passionate one, that one. Just a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I would also rate it a four, and I pretty much agree with Celine's characterization of it. There's a lot of things I loved about the show. Pacing was probably its biggest fault. Samantha kind of alluded to that earlier. The, the, again, these middle parts of both seasons were very slow. There was some time spent on comic relief in places where maybe there shouldn't have been, and then other times they were really 
stretching out certain aspects of the story. Like in the second season, there was a lot of time spent with Peggy and the Jason flirtation, which was fine, except then it was just a love triangle to create a love triangle in the end. And yeah. that felt yeah. a little like it wasn't paid off. Forced. Yes, a little forced. So I just feel like there were definitely flaws. I'm not sure that I agree with the sentiment, although you were kind of hedging on it, Kristen, and riding the fence, that maybe it didn't deserve a third season. I think they set up some interesting possibilities, certainly by spoiler through the elimination of the Jack character in the very last seconds of the show, but it's something that we may never know about. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the treatment of the Peggy Carter character in the film franchises as we get forward in this conversation. So we're averaging about a high, high three, I would say. 3.5 to 4, which is good. So let's start talking about the show. Did you like it right away? Did you have to watch it for a while, let it grow on you? This is a looking back now, so you can talk generally or specifically. It's however you feel you need to wax about Agent Carter. What did you love? What did you hate? I thought the first episode was brilliant. Yes. That was a very solid starting point. And even from the, honestly, the music started, and I was like, I love Carol Emerald, who was the person who sang the very first song in the very first episode. And I was like, and then it was just the opening shot. And like, as you said, the cinematography of this show was fantastic. Yes, and it just was. the imagery of, you know, all these men in suits walking and in gray suits. And then you see Peggy walking down in her blue blue dress and her red hat and it was just fantastic and you don't get to see very many period pieces in in comic books everything is updated like batman has had superman all of them have had a million and a half reboots and all of them into modern time and to you know take a time to go back and to look at an origin story I mean, Captain America is the last one I think they did. Everything else is all up to date, and even Captain America is just jumped time. And seeing it's a female led one, too. In comic books, it's so rare that females get any shining lights. The cinematography was really refreshing. But you don't see that even in modern shows, the way the colors look and just the way everyone moves is just so different. That that's what I really loved about it right from the get go. And I think what really got to me first was some of the inherent sexism of the era, which you certainly don't want them to glaze over it or pretend it didn't exist. But when you don't live that every day, it can get a bit wearing to watch. I'll agree. I, I loved the first episode. I mean, immediately it drew me right in. I loved that they kind of, you know, crossed the bridge between the film and then leading into the TV show, I like that they went back and kind of recapped, pun not intended, the end of Captain America <laughs> and Peggy's relationship so you could really see and feel that emotion again, whether you'd seen Captain America the movie or not. But I agree, I, I felt totally immersed in that 1940s world, just the way that they shot it, the colors, the even everything from top to bottom, I felt completely invested and just in awe of the world that they created. And I felt that even strongly it carried over to season two when they moved it out to L.A. I, I felt it was just as strong of a world. They did such a great job. And that was that was my first immediate reaction was, I want to live there. This is, <laughs> this is beautiful. Yes, there's crazy sexism. And like Samantha said, that it needs to be there because, you know, Peggy went from being this awesome secret agent to, oh, hey, hey, ladies, the war's over. Go back to being housewives or getting our mm. coffee. You know, that was a reality for a lot of women, and I like that they included it. It was smartly done. I, I think they did a great job also in highlighting the sexism, and they brought it to your attention, and they showed, I think, not only how bad it was back then, but they did a great job of highlighting the fact that it's still here, just because you're not paying attention to it every day. Like, oh, here's one of the ways it's here. And they also, from the beginning of like the first season all the way to the end of the second season, they did an amazing job. Like in the first episode, how I think it's Thompson who says, "Oh yeah, go get our lunch. You know, you can you can be helpful today. Go get our lunch sam our, our lunch orders." And then in the very last episode, Thompson's like, "How can I help?" And they're like, "Why don't you go get our lunch orders, Thompson?" And he's like, "Oh, okay, I yeah." <laughs> I just love the role reversal and the, the mm -hmm. gradual acceptance of all the guys to being like oh she's legit she knows what she's doing and yeah that was brilliant and 
you brought up the recaps. I think my favorite thing about the entire when they did the radio shows with Captain America oh, and, and Betty Carver. Yeah. That oh. yeah, that little there was a lot of tongue in cheek that was moments beautiful. that were super fun, and that was one of them. And it was a really nice way to recap too, while also making fun of, and at yeah. the same time making your heart hurt because you would see Peggy hear it and be like, "Oh, that's not how it happened." But oh, I miss him. I miss him so much. I know. Yeah, oh. I I loved those tongue in cheek moments. I think there was one. I don't remember where it was because I binged it. Peggy was talking about how making a movie off of a comic book isn't successful or isn't a smart thing to do. There was a few of those little moments like, (laughs) I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Yeah, they were cute. Yeah, just to recap off of what, off of what Kristen said of just absolutely brilliant tying it into the end of the movie. And it took me by surprise because I remember the first time I saw Captain America and being like, oh my gosh, we're not getting a happy ending. This is really sad. This is not how a comic movie is supposed to end. So having had some time pass between seeing the movie and seeing the show and then having that sort of emotional gut punch right off the bat, it's like, oh no. I I have to, I mean, there's little I can say to disagree here. (laughs) I agree with pretty much everybody's sentiments. I mean, the giddiness with the sort of the flashbacks to the movie. I'll reiterate what I said in the in my rating. I think the best part of the show for me was the visual aspects of it. I mean, I even zeroed in on like how precise all of their victory rolls and their hair were yeah. <laughs> and how they had all of these like very dainty suits with very specific accessories that were very period and it was spot on yeah cars that on. they made just for it so that they could be parked somewhere on the street to make it look like the 1940s mm-hmm. you know even the radio that we see Jarvis with his wife using in season two was very period I mean, they put a lot of thought into this and and setting up this period world. But I also love the fact that they did show the sexist society of back then, because even though it was back then, and maybe you and I don't live it every day, the fact of the matter is some of that stuff is rearing its ugly head yet again. I'm not trying to be political. It just is coming back out again. So it was kind of a timely refresher of how far we've come and how far we still have to go. There was a little bit of message. There was a little pedanticness. But in the end, I didn't mind it because it was folded up into a character. And I'm going to talk about Haley Atwell. I think she is... An actress. She's been in Britain and you, you know, a lot of the British TV and film for a long time. She really only broke through with the Peggy Carter character. ABC has not really done right by her. They've given her two series and canceled both. Mm-hmm. And I think she's a phenomenal actress. I think she's got a lot to offer. And she sort of is synonymous with this character. And I love how she handles it, how she has, she builds a rapport with everybody. There's a, an easy flowing chemistry that she has with all of the other characters, male or female. And I think that's not something you can manufacture. That's really, really good talent. And I liked her a lot, you know. I also like Enver, however you say his last name. (laughs) (laughs) I love him. Who plays Sousa, who was originally on Dollhouse. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was a big fan of and watched all two seasons of that. (laughs) Yeah. I I love that he kind of became her new love interest, primary love interest, I should say. It was a nice kind of juxtaposition against Steve Rogers, very Steve Rogers-esque, without the whole Captain America piece, plus he was disabled, he was not a traditional superhero, but still heroic, Mm -hmm. and that was a fun little piece that they Mm -hmm. played with. So there was a lot to like about the show, but the direction was sloppy, and also the network didn't treat it very well. No, No, not at all. They have a tendency to do that with these little... I'm going to call this one a spinoff, even though it's not a spinoff of a television show. They have a track record of not treating these spinoffs very well. When it seems like they're more for a niche audience and not the general viewing public, they don't give them the respect that they deserve or the time that they should give them as far as time slot goes. Which begs the question, if they're going to do that, why do they even bother making it to begin with? Not that I'm unhappy about it. Or that, you know, I, I didn't want to see Agent Carter, but it, that kind of stuff infuriates me. And yeah. then everybody has mentioned they didn't make it available on any streaming They still sites. haven't. Yeah. You can't I'm, catch up on it. I'm so surprised that with the popularity of all the ABC 
you know, the ABC Marvel shows and the Netflix Marvel shows, why haven't they made this available on Netflix? They have Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I mean, they released that whole new season about two weeks after it finishes airing on television. Mm-hmm. Why haven't they made Agent Carter part of that fold? Because she, she guest stars in an, an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. episode as part of a flashback. What a great way to strengthen the brand by making all the Marvel stuff available and not everything but this one. So let's parse out the seasons. The first season had a a general storyline of Howard Stark is being framed and kind of conspiratorially from within. The second season was about this zero matter aspect involving sort of a shady web of conspirators involving a scientist who's an actress, who has a husband, who's a politician, who's part of a secret society, secret society whose members include Red Foreman. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the devil from Reaper, if you watch that show. <laughs> and, you know, there was just kind of a lot of hodgepodging there. Plus, we had sort of the, the dynamics between... Peggy and Jack, Jack being very ambitious and also very sexist, and also her various entanglements, flirtations, and friendships. So what did you think about season one? What did you think about season two? Compare the two if you'd like. I thought season one, personally, was more coherent and a lot easier to follow, to love, to... It just, I think it flowed better, in my opinion. Just in trying to explain season two to anybody, there's no real easy way to explain it. It's a lot hard. It was a lot harder for me to follow, and maybe that had a lot more to do with the fact that I didn't watch it all at the same time. So I, it was a lot of remembering from gaps of watching. But season two was, I think, less coherent and less well done but i loved them both there's both (laughs) things to love about both seasons i also just was not a huge fan of the love triangles love triangles in general really upset me especially when they're heterosexual (laughs) i'm a lot more forgiving when they're not (laughs) but i'm um, calling shenanigans i just i get annoyed with pitting characters against pitting love interests against each other especially when there's not an act natural flow to it when it seems more forced I get I, I get done with it real easy so I would have to say that's probably why my biggest pitfall was season two agreed on the love triangle thing I sort of go back and forth there's certain shows that I love my love triangles and other ones where they're infuriating and this one in particular Peggy's just not the love triangle kind of gal so it didn't seem to make sense to me Amen. that yep. she would you get in that situation mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's probably agreed that that was probably one of the main things I didn't like about season two. I like anything with young Howard Stark. Mm-hmm. I just think he's so charming and wonderful. But I preferred season two because it was just more lighthearted, despite all the dark matter and scary things happening. There were more jokes. That's one of the reasons I like Marvel in general over DC is because it's always lighter and there's more jokes and one-liners and, and funnier. So that's what I got out of season two more than season one. Intervention! <laughs> you couldn't see her face. It was great. <laughs> As the resident DC obsessive, I have to disagree with part of that analysis. I think the DC movies are far darker. <laughs> well, it's true, yes. Well, yeah. 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 It is up and down. Yeah. Well, Arrow goes up and down. You just never know with Arrow. <laughs> but Flash, Supergirl, and even Legends, they, I would say, they are pretty they're light-hearted. all pretty lighthearted, mm-hmm. and generally speaking. I would yeah. agree that with your other half of your sentiment, though, which is that I actually did like Season 2 better than Season 1, although I love Howard Stark, and young Howard Stark, well, all the Howard Starks, and I love <laughs> Edwin Jar. <laughs> Whatever age he is! And his son. Uh, I also love Jarvis. Oh, Anytime yes. we get Jarvis on the oh, screen, yeah. whoever he's interacting with, sometimes he's played as the buffoon, which is okay. But he was given much more of a chance, I think, to sort of play in season two, and that's why I liked that part of it more. I would agree with Celine's sentiment that the story was kind of more all over the place in season two. I think that has partially to do with the fact that it had two additional episodes, but also partially because they spent some time on... I 
I was really confused with the idea of where the second season started because at the end of the first season, she and Sousa were kind of making eyes and perhaps going a certain direction. And then when season two starts... They apparently had broken it off, and I guess I missed when that happened. Well, it, well, at the end of season one, he asked if she wanted to go for a drink, and she turned him down. Uh, and so I think part of it, she wasn't over Captain America quite yet or no. something, but there was. she just said maybe another time. And then, well, yeah, then in he season asked. two, didn't they make the comment that she tried calling him and he just wasn't picking up the phone? And he gave her the excuse, three hours is really hard to, to make. He did say that. Yeah. And suddenly he's in, almost engaged. Yeah. Si- wasn't it six months? Yeah. In between, yeah. and he's been in LA for I'm assuming less than six months because I don't think they shipped him out right away. Yeah. So maybe maximum of five months, and he finds. I so mean, I loved Violet. Don't get me wrong. I thought she was a great character, and mm-hmm. I I actually really shipped them initially. I'm outside of the fact that I was mad at him <laughs> for dumping Peggy, but not really dumping because they weren't dating. Ditching her, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, and that just, I mean, look at how you're describing it. So that just brings up the point that I feel like they forced the separation so they'd have somewhere to go in mm-hmm. season two. Mm-hmm. And then forced Jason in there. Now, I, I I did like the Jason character, and I also liked sort of the secondary commentary on race mm-hmm. that yeah. they brought into it with his character being one of the only of color on the show. But at the same time, they had some charming chemistry, and it might have been okay, but then it was like, oh, but I love this guy. Oh, but I love this guy. I mean, at least I think Jarvis explains it away at some point and says, well, you know, you, you find yourself, you have two suitors that you, you know, two quality suitors, and underestimating your allure or something like that and yeah i buy that but at the same time it was just so kind of it made the story disjointed a little bit and it was already kind of disjointed because Mm -hmm. it was going from sort of a political thriller to a science fiction yeah it made that weird jump for me i kind of going back to the original question i i liked season one's storyline a lot better but there were moments of season two that i thought were stronger like kylie had mentioned i loved more of Jarvis. I missed young Howard Stark. He was definitely a highlight, I thought. Her roommate Angie was a highlight. I really missed her in season two until she popped up at the semi-pseudo musical episode, was which was weird. It was weird, but it was nice to see her again. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I didn't like the story of season two, but I liked the location. I liked the development of her relationship with Sousa again because I was shipping them in season one pretty darn hard and I'm happy that they ended where they did but I also think her chemistry with Dr. Jason Jason Wilkes right I felt like they did have good chemistry as friends when he was solid in his containment unit unit that he built when he just overcome with emotion just grabbed Peggy and kissed her oh that was awkward Mm -hmm. that was and it was just on her face I mean and she was a wonderful actress and it just that her facial expression during the kiss and after she didn't like it she wasn't all about it (laughs) and so that's when for me it's like oh no this isn't happening she's gonna end up with Sousa well that but that was also after the point at which I think Sousa kind of confessed yeah that you know that the reason that Violet broke up with him was because he was still in love with her. Exactly. Which I get, but just, I don't know, once he, once Wilkes, or Jason, once he kissed Peggy, I think that was his nail in the coffin. I know they tried to play it like she was still in love with both, but at that moment, whatever they had going for him, I felt completely changed and dropped off. So I didn't see it as a love triangle anymore. I was just like, okay, when is this guy going to step out of the picture? I was, he was biding his time with me. See, and I'm not sure I ever at any point was like, oh, Peggy loves either of them. I think it was a, I like them both as friends and I, I could see more being there, but I'm not sure I was ever like, oh, she loves them. It was. Yeah. She was attracted to them. She was, yes, attracted and she saw the possibility of more, but I wouldn't say she was at any point in Mm -hmm. love with them. But even, even with Sousa, kind of thinking back on it now. Yeah, I shipped them in season one, but I don't even think Peggy was really attracted to him in that way until he was unattainable, until he was engaged to somebody else. There may have been a little bit in the beginning of season two before that was revealed, but I think Peggy's attitude toward him 
visibly changed after he was engaged. That's what I'm yeah. saying. That whole piece of it was, it was awkward. Just weird. And I don't think they handled it very well, yeah. season one and season two. And the other thing that I struggle with, season one did have a fairly, to use Celine's word, coherent story, but its ending was fabulous. Like, there was yeah. a really strong ending yes. that made me want to watch more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas season two sort of lacked that same punch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was some punch. There was some, like, oh, this happened, and I'm glad Zero Matter stopped being a thing. Yeah. Although it kind of reminded me of that thing on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that was yeah. from the other planet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Is They're it the weird. same thing? I don't know. I, mean, I don't know be. either. Oh, well, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I can't keep track, and I'm behind on Agents yeah. of S.H.I.E.L.D. Well, but. I think season two, I think they ended it on such a nice note that if they wouldn't have had that little epilogue leading into the potential season three with Jack being yeah. executed, that would have been a good wrap-up for the series. It was just that little button that I think left it open and left it awkward at the end. I liked it that the last shot was... Peggy and Sousa just making out at his desk. I don't know. That's just me. That was like, oh, she's getting her happy ending because I'm the girl raised on Disney movies and romantic comedies, and damn it, I want my characters oh. to have a happy ending. So that, for me, was a very satisfying potential series ending. What were you hoping Yes, please, for, Celine. Exactly, Celine. <laughs> I just, it was the making out that bothered me. I was like, a kiss. I could have dealt with a kiss. It was just a little... Much, know, little much. That makes me sound so prudish. God, <laughs> not. Oh, no. Were you shipping Dottie and her or something? I love. Okay, I Dottie, love Dottie was fabulous. I love Dottie. I don't know her and her and Peggy could never. I don't think they're dating material. No, <laughs> I I like Sousa. I I just I don't know. I I like Sousa. I don't know. I guess I got think more. Yeah. <laughs> better ending in mind I was just kind of one of those I think it was just tainted by the entire triangle prior to yeah. it it left kind of a weird taste in my mouth where I was like oh I mean I, I liked him better than Jason for her but it was like I don't know left me in a weird spot yeah fair enough I could have taken more Dottie in season two yeah I really enjoyed her I love that she's season in the wings still yeah I also, liked her better in season two yeah. also question anyone else think that there's a possibility of her being the first black widow because I do. Dottie? Yeah. Because a Black Widow is just a title. Like, there's several Black Widows. This is more Marvel lore than I know. Yeah, Sorry. me too. <laughs> I mean, I could get behind it. She seems awesome. Hey, if she was well, recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. and or Well, it's, the not, agency, a, it's but... not necessarily just a S.H.I.E.L.D. title. Yeah. It's... But she always has the black and red. Motif. Not always, but she, but she generally was, has yeah. it, especially in season two. Food for thought for you guys. I don't know, Samantha's more marvelly. What do you think? I feel like I'm definitely slacking over here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I could see that, and that would be pretty cool. And I think that's where they kind of... I guess they could still technically reboot it at some point, but I feel like they were really short-sighted in canceling it and not getting it. Like, it d- definitely didn't belong on network TV, but they should have gotten it somewhere else, because Marvel and... Well, actually, both of them are all about all this intermingling of the storyline that they could have very easily sprouted off more origin stories just given the timeline. Well, and I initially thought the entire purpose of Agent Carter was to get to the her creating shield. shield. And I was I was really disappointed that we didn't get that before the yeah. show was canceled. Because they made a big point in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., to talk about that that was their origin, and like I mentioned earlier, there was a flashback featuring Agent Carter. Yeah, that's what I was kind of hoping for. I was really like, oh, she's working for the SSR still? Okay, I'll run with it. But yeah, I would have loved to see at least her even come into the idea mm-hmm. of S.H.I.E.L.D. and maybe that being the, the series closer. Yeah. It was, you know, oh, I have an idea. Yeah, that's that been awesome. Done. I could have made out and then told Sousa, hey... Let's have an idea. Let's start this. <laughs> and that would have made it better for you? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, we'll definitely talk about the cancellation and some things in a minute. To your point about DC being better, I will say <laughs> that they do TV shows a lot better. Yeah. And, they're mingling that, and I don't know why it, why Marvel struggles with that. And that's probably a, a greater discussion that's not for today, but it, it puzzles me for you know, a company that has such depth of material, decades and decades, that they just can't seem to get it together on the TV front. Well, I think that this is going off topic, and we do have a <laughs> podcast panel for this. 
I think their Netflix series are better, especially Daredevil and Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones for the win. Mm -hmm. I know you keep saying that. I'm yep. going Daredevil for the win. I know. But whatever. <laughs> and Kristen's all about the female empowerment. She sure is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Luke Cage and Iron Fist are both controversial. They were controversial for our panel. They're controversial worldwide. So you can make your opinions about those two however you want. I think the network Marvel shows, the ones that ABC has tried to launch, have struggled, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. included. I don't think yeah. we can count the X-Men stuff because Fox owns that and they're mm -hmm. just running and doing their own thing on that. And who knows? You know, DC's struggling in the movie arena. It wasn't until Wonder Woman went to when they got their act together, Justice yep. League is going to be a crazy experiment and whether or not they can solve the ills of those franchises. I'm talking to you, Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, it's the same old DC versus Marvel. You can say good and bad about both. But I yep. think, you know, we'll talk about the, the cancellation of Agent Carter as we go because that's part of what we're, we're going to be focusing on today. Because it was a controversial cancellation. Very critically acclaimed, but low rated. We'll talk about that. What I want to hit on is a couple of main points, though. Main episode points. The first is, there was a little bit of a musical sequence in season so two. So random. <laughs> yeah, I liked it, but random. I thought I missed part of an episode. <laughs> Please continue. I'm sorry to interrupt, Kylie. Wow, well, I was going to say, what did you think of it? <laughs> random. Very random. I was like, there's random musical. Okay, I'm, I'm here for it because I'm a musical theater person, but weird spot to put it that it was her subconscious when she was knocked unconscious after being kidnapped or taken past, I don't know, in season two. I liked it. I liked seeing Daniel Souza, the actor, sing and dance. <laughs> I will watch that a thousand times over. But just weird. I liked it for what it was, but I don't know if it really fit with the show. <laughs> it was very, yeah, it didn't, well, that was at the beginning of an episode. It was, it was the, yeah. right at the beginning. That's why I thought I missed something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was, was like very, the, raw, like, it's, it's like the second to last episode, I think, in season two. It was towards the end. It was oddly weird. placed, yep. oddly done, but well done. What? Well, uh, yeah, but weird. There was some good choreography going. There on. was some very, <laughs> and they, I loved all the period choreography that they incorporated and a very stylized song. It was nice it. to see Angie. That's I liked that she came back for that. I said that's the only thing she came back for. I know. Well, they couldn't really have her move to L.A. with Peggy. Oh, That'd no. be weird. I don't know. She was a weird. waitress. What kind of money does she have? Yeah, she's she's. But they're staying for free in Stark's mansion. She's in New moving York. to Stark's other mansion. So I think she's gonna be changing. Right. I don't know. Maybe well, they needed also, money. Also, Peggy wasn't thinking long term. When That's she first true. Moved she, was, she did. She did mention that at one point. It was too. just a vacation. But I don't know. Maybe the show needed money in the budget to bring in Anna Jarvis. And they oh, I did been, love. I Anna. love Anna Jarvis. Yeah. My favorite part of the musical number was Dottie saying, "I'm always in your mind, Peggy." Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that she was dressed like Angie. Yes, that was cool. Which I was wondering if it was maybe her just you know being you know adding to the entire like. I can be whoever I want to be. That's, or, I think so. I think that was part yeah. of it. Because we already saw her dressed like Agent Carter earlier. Oh, I love that So it was scene. kind of fun to see her dressed. I probably like great opening. Actually, that's another yeah. great opening. <laughs> Why did you just whisper? You can't whisper. I, I said it out loud. She okay, said, it was, that's it. another great episode opening was when Dottie was pretending to be Agent Carter and robbing the bank. Yeah. Yes. I agree. Any thoughts, Sam, about the musical episode? I agree absolutely with Kristen, so in a <laughs> better way. I speak for the group, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I agree as well. On the one hand, my initial reaction was, well, that was kind of fun. And then my next reaction was, well, why did it happen? Why was I watching it? <laughs> and maybe if they had done more subconscious musical numbers all throughout the show, it would have made some sense to me, but they didn't. However, I did enjoy all of the characters getting a musical line here or there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some dancing. Even Jarvis. Even yes. Jarvis. Even Jarvis. I and Rose. And I Rose. Oh, them. Rose! <laughs> I, kind of, side note, I love Rose. Same. I wanted more of Rose. She <laughs> is the unsung hero of Agent Carter, the television series. Mm -hmm. And right. 
Was that a rant? It was a <laughs> mini profession of love. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, either way. I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Sorry. Every, every character had at least a musical line, mm -hmm. such as Jarvis and Rose. I and, remember yeah. now. You're so the, the extras, the so-called extras in that musical sequence were from Dancing with the Stars. Did oh, you know that? I did not really? know that. And they also choreographed this number. Hmm. Not surprised. A little bit of cross-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> So let's talk about, before we get into some of the cancellation pieces, let's talk about the series finale, which basically they, they resolve the whole zero matter piece of it. So just kind of set up the story a little bit for the looking back piece. The first season really is just about them clearing Howard's name, and they do, but not without big explosions and the old chief pump, you know, jumping out of a window to his death. That was pretty fun. But then the second season was all about this zero matter piece which gets absorbed by this Whitney Frost character. Whitney Frost is really set up against Peggy as almost the anti-Peggy, especially in that one episode where they kind of show their histories, mm -hmm. their little girlness, and then sort of some of the things that happen through their lives. They're both women in men's worlds, but Peggy was encouraged by her brother, was recruited into the British equivalent of the SSR, she, that's how she ends up in the war, whereas Whitney was sort of downtrodden by her mom, studied science, brilliant, genius smart, but was convinced that the only way she could get ahead was through her looks and her beauty and through acting. It's She runs this company that discovers the zero matter, which I don't think they ever explain what it is. All we know is that it opens the fabric of space and time in the universe, I guess. I don't know. But... She and Jason Wilkes, who we previously referred to, are exposed to the zero matter, and she wants it all. She wants it for the power. She has this need for power because she's always been downtrodden, and he's like, I don't want it. It's scary and horrible and dangerous, and I could die and other people could die. There was kind of that juxtaposition, and then it ended up the team being involved in both stopping her, saving him, but also preventing the zero matter space time rip from destroying the entire western seaboard so or more <laughs> and there was this whole thing with a hover car because apparently howard stark invented a hover car because why wouldn't he exactly I, what doesn't he do? everything he invents is to impress women <laughs> i would be impressed if somebody invented a hover car okay <laughs> just saying i'm just i question where the technology is coming from in 1947, but that's okay. Well, look who his son is, though. Yeah. I mean, it runs in the family. Yeah. 20 well, years later. I'm, I'm just, just saying. That's a few more than 20. It's, yeah. A few more than 20. But still. Uh, you know, genius. Yes, genius. I'm Comic talking about book. availability of materials and possibilities, but that's okay. Hover car saves the world. Sometimes you just have to take things at face value. Yeah. I know. He's just, he just had a new way hard. of looking at the material that were in front of him <laughs> to create said hover car. If you really want to talk about the science of this show. <laughs> I do. <don't. laughs> we can talk about the science of S.H.I.E.L.D. too. because <laughs> That's a different rabbit hole. It sure Even is. though it's in the same universe. Yep. Another podcast. Which we also do. The point is, they save the day, and as Kristen had already just described, Peggy and... Suzo, we're all like kissy kissy, much just a lead chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack, the the character played by Chad Michael Murray, who all throughout he has he has wants nothing to do with Peggy. He is your complete sexist chauvinist pig. Thinks he should be she should be grabbing their lunch orders the whole time. Finally warms up to her. We figure out even though he's been ambitious and kind of working with Red Foreman, I mean Kurtwood Smith, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's also a man. Foreman. Yeah, he's also basically a good man. He just, he realizes the error of his ways, but then some unnamed man in this epilogue, assuming it's a man, it was men's shoes, came in and killed him. Shot him, killed him, left him for dead. Blackout, end of show. I think it was Kurtwood Smith who killed him, a.k.a. Red Foreman, who's not Red Foreman. Dead. I thought he, was died. he died. Did I miss that? I you did? Died okay. Global. I don't know. Well, I'm still going to say that it's Red Foreman. <laughs> I think Whitney ate him. You think she what, ate him? Oh, right. The zero right. Did she eat him? I think she did. Okay. Because she had this ability I lost, to eat people. I lost track of how many people she ate in the show. 
There was a lot. <laughs> of it was either in the last up. It was in the second to last or the last episode. Yeah, there was so much that happened. Oh, I know. They were going to blow up the thing, and Chad Michael Murray did the remote, and then Jason exploded. Oh. Yes. And when Jason exploded, Red Foreman probably exploded too. And Jason but Whitney didn't, and neither did Jason. Right. Because they, never, they both had the zero because matter. Because they had right. zero matter, which they, they were lost. safe. Yeah. With the gamma ray thing. Yes. The gamma ray thing. Yeah. Which I'm surprised the whole That's didn't what it appear. was called. <laughs> yeah, the gamma ray. The gamma ray cannon. So basically, okay. Chris and kind of already touched on it, but did you all think this was a proper send off, proper Caesar, series finale or not? And why not? Series finale, no. Because I don't think no. they knew it was going to be a series finale. From my understanding, they had like a, a, a write up for season three already done when they got yeah, canceled. Like, like basic storyline. I don't know if they thought they were going to continue, but they they were prepared. they were preparing to continue. And I I have to agree with you that had they not added the entire Thompson dying thing, I think it would have been a much more served. acceptable yeah. ending for a series. Although as I yeah. As, as I said, I thought the entire point was to set up S.H.I.E.L.D., so I was disappointed when the show was done mm-hmm. and they hadn't done that. Agreed. Yeah. Have they, Kylie or Celine or Samantha, have any of you heard what season three would potentially, what it would have entailed? Like, uh-huh. were they starting to get to S.H.I.E.L.D., or do we not know? Was that never released? I've seen nothing in research. Okay. I would have to no. dig. Del- dig back okay. through things of the past I read. I don't off the top of my head okay. remember. But it was just interesting to see where they were thinking of taking Because sometimes they do release what the next mm-hmm. storyline gen- generally would have been at once they've canceled the show. I was also upset that they didn't definitively, after they canceled the show, let us know if Sousa was indeed Peggy's husband. It annoys me that they have still haven't told us who she married. If she married even. No, she did. Did she? Because they mentioned that in one of the movies. Captain America. The, was, did she die in Winter Soldier or she, Civil War? She died in Civil War, okay. but he visited her in the nursing home in Winter Soldier. I think Winter Soldier was when she talked about her husband. husband. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would assume it's Sousa. I, I, I would assume. I assume that it's Sousa. It would have been nice to have confirmation post yeah. right. Carter. Yeah, because even like with her funeral and everything, it was still yeah. Peggy Carter. It was never Peggy Carter hyphen something. something. It was, they left it very. I think they left it very clear so the audience would know who it is. Mm-hmm. Do we? Did they? No, we don't. We don't okay. know who her husband was. I was looking on Wikipedia too. There was no mention of who she married. What do you think, Sam? Do you think this was a proper send off? Not for a season finale. Yes, not for a series finale. Did I say those right? Yeah. Yes, you did. You did. It just, when you find out after the fact that that was it, you feel a bit cheated. Mm -hmm. One of the things, we're going to kind of go through some of the cancellation logic, and one of the things I want to ask you, because to be fair, and by fair I mean it really wasn't fair because this the network did not market this well. I mean, I only saw, I saw previews on the television and I knew it was coming out, but that was the extent of it. Were you surprised by its first renewal? Were you surprised by its cancellation? What was your thoughts when during the progress of the show? And do you think the show deserved to be canceled? I don't think so. But at the same time, again, it really wasn't, I think, a show designed to flourish on network TV that really lets ratings drive it. Those same ratings on a cable network would be seen as successful. So I don't think they really give things enough time. I can't say that I was surprised by the renewal of season one because I didn't watch season one until season two was three weeks from airing. I wasn't surprised by the cancellation given what I had heard of ratings during season two, but at the same time I have to agree that that was a show not geared towards your everyday audience. It was definitely a niche show and given that it was doing amazing and with everything that it had to say, and like, once again, had they put it on Netflix, I think the viewership would have been so much better. You couldn't get to see it, so if you didn't know about it or watch it when it aired, it was very hard to see. So it was almost like, our ratings are low, but we're not in any way trying to help them. Well, and the way they marketed it, it, it really, in my mind, isn't a comic book show in the way that many of the others are, but they branded it that way. If they had gone for more like the female empowerment demographic and build it more of a spy program, I 
tend to think it might have done better. I mean, I also think that a lot of the times when it comes to comic book anything, any any advertisement, any marketing for women led things are just atrocious in general because they don't know comic how to books it. don't know how to exactly they don't know how to market because it. there are very few women in the you know in charge to market to women who want to see mm-hmm. it it's men or I guess not always men but the ones in charge who are trying to market it towards other people aren't marketing it right so the network greenlit the show. In your opinion, what do you think motivated the decision to to actually make the show happen? And what would you say to the network head today, given the show's ultimate cancellation? This would be the network head back then because it's actually changed <laughs> since since that has happened. This that, kind of piggybacks on did the show deserve to be canceled? So kind of include that thought process too. Well, I think its initial inception was writing that wave of success from the movies and Marvel just wanting to branch out and really capitalize on that success. That said, I I just don't know that they went about it the right way. I just did a bit of mini research here and it sounds like the series was initially brought up in July of 2013. So it was riding on the coattails of the first Captain America, but also they did make an original Agent Carter was a one shot little mini movie that premiered at San Diego Comic-Con later that year too and there was so much interest that they thought hey we could actually do this. It was the initial love of Peggy Carter in Captain America and fan outcry we want more. We loved her. I mean I don't think there was a person Mm -hmm. who said I don't like Peggy Carter. She's why would you make a show about her? I don't I don't know if there was anybody Mm -hmm. (laughs) who was really like oh that'd be terrible. Oh, right, and their interplay really made that movie. Yeah. Yeah, it did. So did the show deserve to be canceled? No one's a- answered that question. <laughs> I'm going to say no, because I just found what season three would have been about. Oh. Oh, do tell. There was a possibility that season three would have been set in London, because, quoting the article, you can put the show anywhere because it's spies. The location is all about, you know, it's determined by the story that we want to tell. Just like, you know, L.A. worked better for the story that they wanted to tell in season two. The seeds for the third season had been planted all throughout the second, and especially with the end of the second season with someone shooting Thompson and taking the M. Carter file. And since M. could either be Margaret or her brother Michael, we don't know which one it would have been about. I assumed, yeah. that it, was, I assumed it was about Michael, mm-hmm. just because of the twist. And, they, and then also Haley Atwell went on to add that the third season would have gone further back into Carter's past while having a twist, something to do with her family, and more insight would have been provided on her brother Michael. So it would have been about finding out what happened, all the, the civilian casualties in that moment of the war, and more of her backstory with her family and her brother. I would have been here for that third season. I would have watched it and loved it. If that's the storyline they were going to go with, Season three could have potentially been the strongest one. And what's interesting is when you think about it, it's Agent Carter. So they're not doing anything if they should shift focus to, to Michael. Michael, Agent Michael Carter. Mm-hmm. And what's really cool is Jarvis can go with her anywhere. Exactly. Stark's they're, got money. They're, 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 they're partners partner. now. They're <laughs> really, he's her partner. And he even said at the end of the second season, you know, if you have any further need... He's like, I'm, I'm always going to go with you. I, you know, I love this life. I'm going to go. And I feel like Anna's going to be like, get out of the house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Leave me with Rose. You guys go off and do things. But like, I love you, honey. But yeah. sometimes you get, <laughs> mm-hmm. go do. <laughs> yeah. So Kristen says, no, it didn't deserve to be canceled. I don't I, think, I don't think so. I don't think it deserved to be canceled either. It had its pitfalls. It had pacing issues, but... What show doesn't? How many times have we said yeah. that about other shows? Well, so. And sometimes the second season of a show is a difficult one. Yeah. Alias had a horrible second season. No, it didn't. That was, was Rita Jarevko. Sorry, no. It was the third <laughs> season. It was the third season that was weird. But there's always, like, seasons two or season three in a show tends mm-hmm. to be a little wonky because, you know, that now they've got their audience, now they have to prove that they are worth yeah, hanging on to. And it's always a transition period because they've either come to the end of their great idea that they had initially and now they've got to right. work past it yeah. and with a bigger budget, with more people, yep. hypothetically more episodes. Yep. No, I don't think it should have been canceled. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like there was so much more to tell and 
just like the conversations and the interplay between her and Jarvis. It always just made me smile. You know, he was one of the few guys who could really poke fun of her and her back at him. And there was some genuine affection there yeah. without her being a love interest. Exactly. Yeah. Also, how often do you get a male-female relationship that's not plagued by romance? Romance. And they just had a perfect, like, yeah. Platonic. Platonic they did. relationship. And I felt like they were the parents of everybody half the time. They were just like, all right, right. nope. <laughs> Come back. Calm down. <laughs> Except for when Jarvis had meltdowns. Yeah. yeah. Which oh, he also. Quite frequently. <laughs> I, I kind of like Jarvis. Terrific. Yeah. <laughs> Jer- Terrific. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I want to know if that was written or if you made that or, up. Yeah. I want to know. <laughs> well, I don't think it deserved to be canceled. I agree with Sam's earlier comment that, you know, if this had been on a different network i'm not quite sure abc studios owns all the shows on netflix so i'm not really quite sure why they decided to go with this format and then they also plugged it in basically they put it during the agents of shield hiatus Mm -hmm. each time which i guess might have worked in theory except for the fact that if if really what we were trying to do was tell the origin story of how carter started shield they never made it that far no and that seemed like a really weird place to put it. And also it wasn't on the same night, because on the second season anyway, it was on Monday nights. Yeah. And S.H.I.E.L.D. plays on Tuesdays. So I'm, I'm just, or at least it did. It did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's changing this coming season. But So I just, I, I feel like the network greenlit it, to go back to the earlier question, I think Sam's right. They were trying to ride a wave. There was some fan support at Mm -hmm. SDCC, but at the same time, I think there was somebody who really didn't believe in it Mm -hmm. at some point, because they did not give this show kind of the buoy that it needed. And one of the things we're going to talk about, let me actually skip down to that question, because it kind of ties in, and I didn't necessarily write the talking points in order. So there's a little bit of an analysis. I got this from, you know... Wikipedia, but it is cited and footnoted. It's not one of those random things that people have added. (laughs) I'm going to read it, and I want you to kind of react to this. So this is what it says. Arguing for the renewal of the series for a third season following its low viewership, critic Maureen Ryan said that, quote, letting the show die would be a serious mistake for the network and for the bigger Disney ABC conglomerate. These days, entertainment properties have to be viewed not just through the lens of their ratings, admittedly weak for Agent Carter. They have to be evaluated within the context of the overall value they bring to any entertainment colossus, and what Agent Carter adds to Disney ABC is simply too valuable to give up, bringing something different to the company's superhero portfolio, end quote. She suggests that if ABC did not renew the series for broadcast, it should explore other opportunities, such as debuting it on its online Watch ABC app or being sold to Netflix, where, quote, fans of superheroic storytelling already flocked to, end quote, and Agent Carter's, quote, status as a period piece, which may have harmed it on broadcast, could be a real draw for Netflix viewers, end quote. Ryan also felt Marvel could copy what CBS is doing with Star Trek, quote, unquote, by creating a subscription service for a monthly fee where consumers could access Marvel's films and television shows, as well as premium exclusives like a third season of Agent Carter. Ryan concluded, quote, a third Agent Carter season could help solidify Marvel's standing, not just with female fans, but with everyone who appreciates excellent and adventurous storytelling. There's a little bit more to that, but that's kind of the the basic analysis. What do you guys think? How do you feel about that reaction piece? That's coming. Maureen Ryan is a fairly well-known television critic. New York Times, I think. Mm-hmm. I have to double-check that. But To add to that, again, with my little research I did a few minutes ago, they did shop it to Netflix, and Netflix turned it down for season three because they were trying to focus on original content and not expanding on their Marvel content, which is weird since they have then added more Marvel shows to their fold since then. But there were other options being proffered, such as the ABC app or the subscription piece where they can make their Marvel library available like CBS Mm -hmm. is doing with Star Trek. I have to agree with her in that a lot of what is coming out is all the same, and by offering this period piece, that it it offered something different that isn't seen in... I, I don't know much about the rest of ABC's shows, but isn't at least in the MCU universe that ABC has. I mean, I don't know exactly how much period pieces, like, fall into grabbing 
different fans, but I know it was a huge draw for me. And it offered what nothing else has offered, I think, to a lot of people. And I have to agree that in terms of reaching out and growing a portfolio, it was huge. And that the loss of it was, I think, big. Yeah, I mean, this was Marvel's first female-led anything. anything. <laughs> I mean, there's been strong supportive female characters. Like, you know, Black Widow comes to mind. She's been a supportive figure in multiple. But they haven't or had... Or Daisy slash Quake. Kind of right. Of shield. But mm-hmm. she's not the lead. You know, Agent Carter was the lead in... We won't get anything until, what, Captain Marvel comes out mm-hmm. in a couple years, but that still hasn't even started shooting yet. No. You know, I, I, Marvel is seriously lacking on strong female leading characters, and I think that's why, I mean, we joke about it on the, the Marvel Defenders panels, that I'm so, I'm such a Jessica Jones diehard, but I think part of that is there is no other female superhero that I can get behind. I want to get behind a female superhero. You know, I there's not enough of them. Wonder Woman has done wonderful things recently mm-hmm. with the movie, and Marvel needs that. And I think that's why I liked Agent Carter and Jessica Jones so much. It filled that void for me. And I mean, even in the comics for Marvel, there's there are female superheroes, but they're even the comics like there's limited amounts of comics available. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, you have. Miss Marvel, you have Captain Marvel, you have Squirrel Girl. So, yeah, I mean, they, they have limited runs or they have yeah. certain amounts, but there's nowhere near the amount of literature for them as there is for men. And mm-hmm. like, Agent Carter isn't exclusively her own. Like, she's not her own comic, no. as far as I'm, unless they've made one recently. And they say they don't want. They wanted original content. I mean, okay, so she was a character that was through something else, but in it of itself, like there is no real basis Mm-mm. in the comics for this. So it was in and of itself kind of original, it was yeah, partially original at least. <laughs> well, and one of the things that kind of this analysis goes on to mention is that by virtue of where they take her character in the next two Captain America movies, they've effectively killed her off. Yeah, yeah. they closed out her storyline without fully expanding upon it like they could have. Hashtag potential. That well, is a, then, you know, that's a different podcast. That's a different podcast. But they're, they're, again, they had a ton of potential with this character. And they even killed off the connection that she had to, like, there was in, I think it's the Civil War, they mentioned Sharon Carter, who was in the comics her niece. But because of time and everything else, they effectively cut that out, too. Like she, it's, her exists, but, yeah, it's her great it's niece. It's her great niece. It's her great niece now. They killed off Michael, so how did that happen? Unless he had a, a kid before he died. <laughs> right. So I don't even know how she has a niece, let alone a great niece. You're right, they yeah. cut her off, they, they effectively killed her. Yeah, they closed her chapter. I almost have to wonder that because it's a period piece and they got so much of the world right, if it just made it too expensive compared to some of the other Marvel shows, and they just, based on the ratings it got, didn't believe that they were going to recoup that down the line. It seems short-sighted, but so many things always come back to money. Well, on the, on the same note, though, like, once you've already bought all those pieces, you can, reuse you know, them. reuse them. And by not giving the show maybe another season, they're effectively keeping that cost at what it is rather than mm-hmm. having the potential to make more off of it. Right, and a lot of times shows will recoup their budgets by merchandise sales and or the, licensing deals. They haven't merchandised anything for Carter. No. They or haven't. streaming, which is the other thing. Yeah. There's a lot of after viewing that they're starting to measure, but they didn't really... I mean, I think it might have been on Hulu for a little while Maybe, during yeah. its run, but they did not keep it. You cannot get it now unless you buy it. You yeah. have to buy it streaming or DVD. Well, and going off of that, how can you judge ratings anymore by first view and right. given yeah. how many people wait until a season's done and view it online because they'd rather watch it all in one go rather than mm-hmm. watch it week to week yeah they're and really starting to measure that now they're looking at what the live plus seven for dvr views and then they're also looking at the streaming numbers once it gets released to netflix or hulu in its entirety but that like Kylie said that wasn't really a big thing i mean even it's 2016 was last year mm-hmm. but it's still Streaming has just rapidly taken off. It's so new. Well, and I mean, and fandoms all around. Like, how many people might get together and watch on one TV? So do you think this show will hold up as time passes? Do you think, obviously you said you don't think it should have been canceled. 
and that you would have watched more seasons should someone try to bring it back if it was possible yes 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 to all the above i think it because it is a period piece it's going to hold up a lot better Mm -hmm. than being set in the present day. The technology will never be out of date because we've already passed that period in time. And I think the writing is pretty classic where you're still going to get the jokes 10, 15 years from now because they're just, they're classic jokes. And I think if someone were to pick it up, do it. I think every, from what I understand, it sounds like the creators and Haley Atwell, they're more than ready to revisit the character if something were to manifest Okay. <laughs> Once again, I speak for the team. Apparently you do. Yeah, we are well. <laughs> so Agent Carter was created by the writing team, again, of Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. And basically, they're the ones who have written the screenplays for all of the Captain American films, Captain America films, plus a, they've contributed to some of the Thor films and the MCU. This was their very first TV series collaboration ever, and only their second TV project ever. The first was a TV movie that was not Marvel-related. How do you feel they did on their first time out? Would you watch any other series created by this duo or separately, though they probably, they're always a team. They're always a team. Would you watch anything else they make? Yeah. I yeah. mean, there were pitfalls, but as a first project uh, for happen. TV, I think they did pretty darn well. And I mean, I would have to see whatever their next show is, but if they keep getting better... I mean, I at least have to give it a chance because they did really well with Carter. Well, and the fact that they'd never done TV before, that kind of, in my mind, explains some of the pacing issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're running out of steam. Okay, let's pick it up. Let's figure out what we're doing now and then having a strong finish. Yeah, I agree with Samantha. I think that does explain away some of the pacing issues, but I think they should have maybe improved a little bit about pacing in season two, (laughs) but maybe because it was an additional two episodes, that was maybe a curveball that they weren't expecting to get a longer season order. But I would definitely watch another project of theirs. I have thoroughly enjoyed, you know, all the Captain America movies. I think they're some of the strongest in the MCU right now. But yeah, I think like what Celine said, I'd need to see what the content would be if they were to do another TV series. And yeah, I think it'd be worth giving it a watch. I would watch it. I would like to see them try to get outside the comic book genre, see what happens. Maybe they could do another historical fiction piece. Mm -hmm. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) How does Agent Carter compare to other TV shows? Now, I said other genre TV shows, but this was kind of a hodgepodge of several different genres thrown together, Mm -hmm. comic book adaptation aside. How would you rate it compared to other shows generally speaking this is a looking back question i always have to ask this question from a historical perspective i'd say it did pretty well i don't know that i'd rate this science fiction even with some of the weird stuff in (laughs) season two from a procedural perspective i am a law and order all the way kind of person so i'd probably say it was a bit lacking I think as far as the action adventure spy drama goes I still would rank Alias a little higher but there's also more content with that show but I would probably put it in a strong second place for me because those are the two spy shows that I really like Carter and Alias I like it better than Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. now that I've actually seen it and again even though Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has more content I feel like they have struggled a lot longer (laughs) over their seasons with more episodes and I feel as a whole Agent Carter is more solid but as far as the over the entire Marvel television library, including the ones on Netflix, I would probably probably rate it in the top three. I'm not sure where in the top three, but Jessica Jones and season two of Daredevil would oh, be. Geez. I know. <laughs> Spencer and Nick and Hillary and Kyle aren't here to rank. They're not here. Around. But I would rank it within the top three with Jessica Jones and Daredevil being in that top three as well. So it's in the top quarter of the Marvel television shows that have been produced. It's a hard one because it doesn't have a lot of like similar shows like it to compare it to yeah. not only in the fact that it's such short seasons like 8 and 10 so you can literally be like hey you're not doing anything for the next 12 hours I have a show for you and I mean like period wise there's not a lot of movies that happen after World War II Mm-mm. and like a lot of ones during World War II. Or the 30s, or, right before. Yeah, or the 30s, yeah. but there's not a lot after World War II. And in that regard, like, it's kind of in a, in a, in a time all of its, its own. own. It's probably one of the more watched 
this is the first season is because it's the only one I have, TV shows that I have, probably because it's eight episodes. <laughs> so it's a lot easier to pawn off on someone. It's only eight episodes. Well, watch this. In terms of, I guess, genre-wise, sci-fi, like second season, it reminds me most of Warehouse 13, which I'm also thoroughly in love with. <laughs> <laughs> she was so now thinking about Warehouse 13 there. And she sure did. H.G. Wells is my babe. <laughs> It's it's high ranking in terms of what's the original question? <laughs> Where does it rank how, amongst other yeah, shows? Yeah, how would you compare it to other shows? It ranks high among other shows, and it's one of those that I often recommend to other people. But I'm not quite sure where I would rank it in terms of things. In terms of other shows I've talked about, it's lower than Person of Interest, but way higher than The Hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm looking at it from my perspective. I think that Agent Carter as a television show project is in some ways better than a lot of TV shows, mainly because of its uniqueness. It had a very specific kind of palette niche as the word has been used because it did have the historical aspect but it incorporated sort of the sci-fi superhero piece. I mean that world still existed even though we didn't always see it on the screen. Obviously, we knew Captain America existed, and Howard Stark will produce Iron Man someday. <laughs> <laughs> the man who will become Iron Man. So we know that that's all possible in this universe. Maybe we didn't see it as much. In terms of the Mar... I, I would probably try to look at it in terms of the Marvel shows. I, I think that Chris and I have a differing opinion on where the <laughs> Netflix shows rank. I, I do think it was better than Agents. I do think it's better than Agents of Shield. It's Definitely. more solid than Agents of Shield completely. I, I like Daredevil and I like Jessica Jones better than Agent Carter, and I probably like Iron Fist. I'm controversially, I controversially like Iron Fist. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people did not like Iron Fist, but I liked Iron Fist for <laughs> reasons that people didn't under maybe agree with. <laughs> but I don't care. I can like it. I think it would be on par with Iron Fist for me. They're totally different, so it's hard for me to compare the two. And they suffered from some of the same problems. Pacing-wise, there was a weird middle for Iron Fist as well. It's way better than Luke Cage. I don't like Luke Cage at all. We all talked about that. I mean, I liked some of it. I'm not trying to be a thing. But <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the Marvel TV shows, I would say it's probably squarely middle for me as well. I don't know about top three. And I think it's unique among shows, but I think there are a lot of shows that are better than it, too. Celine, you heard your hand is raised, student. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> remembered that something that I really, 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 really wanted to see in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was Howard Stark meeting his wife, his future wife. Yeah. And seeing... Yeah. Because I, I love Playboy Howard Stark. I love the way he plays that. He just does so amazing. And I would have really enjoyed seeing that in this season, him meeting his future wife and seeing him lose it as like a playboy into yeah. being like I just that's that something that I was fun. really looking forward to seeing eventually. I'm yeah. sorry. I don't know what sparked that idea, <laughs> but it popped into my head. Hey, hashtag potential. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna kinda build off of the niche section that well, not section comment that Kylie had made, the niche comment. I feel like with A B C they're now embracing the niche market supposedly by moving Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Once Upon a Time to Fridays with their new Inhumans series. Yes, I, but I, I'm embracing just, if they're moving it to Friday. I know. I saw I, it's embracing with quotation marks. I mean, I thanks for thinking either. that the nerds don't go out. We go out. <laughs> yeah. We go out and do things. <laughs> Comic Cons are on Fridays. Get with the program. <laughs> but just thinking that, you know, supposedly they're trying to embrace the niche market. You know, NBC appeased their niche market by bringing Timeless back from the brink of actual cancellation. I feel like if Agent Carter would have premiered maybe in 2016, going into 17, I don't think she would have been canceled after two seasons. I don't know. I feel, I feel like if, you know, season two, if season two would have happened in the 16-17 season, I feel 17-18 we would have gotten to season three. I also think they did a lot of terrible things in terms of they coupled a lot of episodes together because of the way that they aired. Yeah. Like, I, I remember it being a big thing that 
episode one and two were together because they had to move them back because of the the speech people have. It, you know. The State of the Union yes, address? Yeah. That, that I thing. can't believe that I pulled thing. that out of my... <laughs> uh, and there was, on that. <laughs> there was something else that happened that caused, what was it, six and seven to air on the same yeah, day well, rather than a Well, year. the hard thing, too, with that time slot, there's a lot of award shows that happen. Yeah. There's, like, you know, the presidential speeches happen. Mm-hmm. There's a lot non-television events that happen, like, not scripted television events that happen. A lot of reality stuff happens. So... Yeah, going off of that, like, I wonder how much better season two might have done if it hadn't had the disservice of being pushed off of maybe a weekend and then two episodes put out once. And Yeah. It's distressing. Yeah. It's distressing. <laughs> I also have to ask this question. It's a typical looking back question. The stars, mainly, and I'm going to focus on the four main ones, which are Haley Atwell, James Darcy, Enver, how do you ever you say his last name, mm-hmm. and Chad Michael Murray. They all have had projects. Haley Atwell, as I've mentioned, has... Comes from British TV and was on Conviction, which got canceled pretty rapidly. James Darcy is kind of a film character actor. He appear, crops up in lots of different stuff, nothing really lead-oriented. Enver was from Dollhouse. That's his biggest project. Otherwise, he's kind of a character actor on TV and film. And Chad Michael Murray, he's, well, he was the lead on One Tree Hill, is currently the lead on Sun Records, if you're on the country music station, and spends some time on the CW and WB with major roles on Gilmore Girls and Dawson's Creek. Would watching this show it motivate you to watch any of their other projects? Why or why not? Absolutely. Anyone specifically, or just all of them? Yes. I love all four of them. Okay. I, I don't know what it is about them, but they just are very watchable and very likable. Haley Atwell, yes, I would, but Conviction just did not sound interesting to me. No. I, that was a poor preview. Yeah, I, I just, the trailer for it didn't look interesting. The entire premise didn't look good. Even it's though kind I, of manipulative. Yeah, that one. even though I like her, I will not seek out conviction the episodes that did air but i would be interested in seeing her in the future james darcy loved him in broad church i'm a big broad church i'm just a big brit tv fan in general so i loved him in broad church and for souza <laughs> with his character name loved him in dollhouse i love dollhouse i thought he was excellent <laughs> Celine and I are having a moment of bonding over That's nerdy things. That's because Celine really loves a dollhouse panel. I do. I said I I I I dollhouse panel. <laughs> yeah, loved him in dollhouse. I, I feel like he has one of those faces where I've seen him in a lot of other yes. things, but nothing in a major role. Mm-hmm. But I've liked him in everything I've seen him in. Chad Michael Murray, I first saw him on Gilmore Girls. I don't expect to watch One Tree Hill. I didn't when it was on. I don't expect to start watching it now. And I don't think I'm going to seek out Sun Records. It just doesn't seem appealing to me. But I loved him in a Cinderella story with Hilary Duff. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But that was yeah. that was a movie, not TV. But I don't know. It For me, as much as I like them, it will depend on what project they're in, except for Enver slash Sousa. I would probably watch it, because he's pretty. In terms of Ken Michael Murray, I was extremely impressed, actually, with how well I thought he did in Agent Carter, because I had a best friend who made me watch the first two seasons of One Tree Hill with her, and it was very groan-worthy for me. (laughs) Nothing against the show, it's just not my type of show. And I saw that he was going to be an Agent Carter, and I was like, Really? Yeah. Why are you doing this to me? But I was impressed, yeah. and I actually liked his acting in the show, and I almost yeah. liked him. I think this character. is probably his best acting to date of the things agree. that I have seen. Agreed. And the other three, I would most definitely at least think about it. Con- like once again with conviction, I was just not impressed with the with the premise, and then it got canceled right away. So I was like, all right, I guess there's no real reason to watch that dollhouse i love dollhouse yes dollhouse Mm -hmm. this is the first thing i've ever seen jarvis in and i thought he was fantastic i love jarvis he's a special place in my heart the disembodied voice and i can't wait to see more of him (laughs) yeah i really i'm gonna miss this show mostly because of jarvis hands down i would have loved to see more of his backstory and and why Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man, chose to create an acronym from his last name to make him his, you know, AI personal assistant, essentially. I also would have loved to have seen Anna and Jarvis raise little Tony, baby Tony Stark. Yeah, that the surrogate child that they yes. can't have. I know, that broke Sad my face. heart. That was not necessary. No. <laughs> so many threads that could have been developed on this show 
which is why I think it should be picked up again myself, because I don't think I answered that question. I would watch, I, I started off saying Haley Atwell, I'm very impressed with her. I would watch Haley Atwell, not in conviction. I watched the, the preview for it, and I thought it was a very poor, very poorly done, and I think audiences were wise to that. I think she needs a vehicle. And maybe not on ABC, so they're not being very nice to her. Yeah, but ABC tends to cast a lot of the same people. Once, yeah, you're, yeah. once you're in the ABC fold, you're kind of in the ABC fold. Well, maybe it's contractually set up that way, but I just I do feel like she's got a lot of potential, again, yeah, she potential that could be better suited someplace. I just don't know what it is. And if they're not going to let her be Peggy Carter... They, I hope they find something for her. James Darcy, I love him. I've seen him in other things. I think this is the, the most fun I've had watching him. Agreed. Enver, I, I also watched and loved Dollhouse. I'm a big weed knight, so I generally like all of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and enjoyed him there. So I don't need, I don't, I'm not going to watch Dollhouse because of Enver. I don't think I would seek out Enver in another project, but if he's there, that would be a bonus, as Kristen likes to say. Chad Michael Murray, I yes, I agree this was his best project to date. I don't really have any interest in him. He always kind of, he has kind of a type that he plays. Now, I don't know what he did on One Tree Hill, but he's been kind of the DB douche bro kind of guy yeah, for a lot of times. That's what I understand, yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like I, 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 don't, I don't need to see him. I think he's playing too much to a type. And he continued playing to a type just with a historical lens on the show. So I really don't want to follow him. I'm very much more impressed with Haley and James. Jarvis, I think, was really my favorite character. Peggy Carter aside, I mean, I love Peggy, but I I think I loved Peggy and Jarvis, the duo, the coupling, the team, the friendship. That was my favorite part of the show. I know Celine has mentioned that she has recommended it multiple times, Whenever possible, and shoves DVDs in people's faces. <laughs> Kristen and Samantha, would you recommend it? Yes. Oh, I thought you were going to say more. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, no explanation needed. Just, yes. Please. Um, and, and that's the thing, for as, as many of the reasons why I sort of struggled with it at the time, I look back at it with some affection and would very easily watch it again. It, it has rewatchability for me. That's always my top recommendation. It's like, watch this. You can watch it several times, and it'll still be great. Do you have any justification, Kristen? No justification needed. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's a good show. Watch. I'm not sure if you remember this as a podcast. <laughs> I've given two hours of justification <laughs> prior to this question. Minutes. I've Seven given minutes. an hour and 45 <laughs> minutes of justification <laughs> for this show, so watch it. Okay. Well, I would also recommend it. I think, especially to women, especially to women, geeky women like the four of us. <laughs> I think that if you're, Kristen talked about being hungry for a female role model, and all of the panelists have mentioned that the comic book companies aren't quite so up with women, strong women, lead women in their comic book properties. I do think DC is handling that a little bit better right now, comparatively to Marvel. So Marvel, this really was an opportunity for you to do that, and I think ABC and your whatever relationship that you guys have, you need to kind of work that out and Mm -hmm. (laughs) make something happen. And if it's not going to be Agent Carter, then there's got to be some other opportunities. I don't know what those could be. I'm not as up on the Marvel stuff. I've ca- I've caught up on everything, but I don't know what lends itself well to TV besides what we've seen so far because I just don't know it. Whereas if you could talk DC, I'd be able to talk you through all of that stuff. <laughs> so that's just where I'm at with it. But I do I would recommend it. It is really hard to come by though. So if you want to, you can download it on Amazon Prime. I don't work for the company, but that's where I know you can get it for a payment. You have to pay for it. It's not it's actually not Prime, then. It's just regular Amazon. Or you can buy the DVDs. I don't think it's anywhere streaming mm-hmm. that I could find, certainly. And the question was asked many times. So yeah, how are, by how me. are you watching this? Where can, you where can I get this? I, I need to watch it. I'm too years Sorry, behind. I should have lent you my first season. Because no. then I still would have had problems finding the second. Yeah. Yeah. If you live in Grand Rapids and know me, I'll lend you my first season. She will. Yeah, <laughs> she has. Celine's library of Agent Carter. Oh, I have a lot. Of stuff I can lend people. Other than what we have already said, talked about, ruminated on, reminisced about, do you have anything else to say looking back at Marvel's Agent Carter? I feel like I didn't 
tell you about my love for Angie, guys, and I feel like I shorted her. I love Angie. <laughs> <laughs> she was some great comedic relief in season one. And that scene where she acted about Peggy's grandmother being gone or being sick. She was crying, and Thompson didn't know what to do. He was like, oh, God, don't. Yeah, where she started what? crying on Thompson. That was, <laughs> and yes. Angie Water, and then Peggy came into the window, and she's like, that was some great acting. Oh, I, I died. Because it, was, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't, but it was beautiful. <laughs> I could have used more Rose. Yes, <laughs> yeah, agreed. And we got a lot more of her in season two. We I did, which I liked. Loved that they took her out in the field. Me too. And the entire conversation between Sousa and, and Peggy about him being like, we don't know who we can trust. And Peggy's like, yeah, we do. Rose. Rose. And he's like, she has no field experience. And he's like, every day is field experience for her. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, and I liked that she got to punch out Peggy yes. at the end of the musical sequence, which is what stopped it. Because I feel like Rose would do that. She would, yeah. She'd be like, what are you doing? No, that's wrong. I just want to say that I love that the front for the SSR in LA was a talent agency. Right. And that yeah. Rose was basically the yes, receptionist was, yeah. slash... Rejector of all talent. Yeah. Well, <laughs> everybody then, who came in got yes. rejected. And then the fact that she mentioned we're not even like we have the wrong address listed and we don't advertise and I don't know how people find us, but they do. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very LA problem. Yeah. <laughs> so I understand. Well, with that said then, what I would like to do at this time is thank Samantha, Kristen, and Celine for joining me to discuss, reminisce about, look back at Marvel's Agent Carter, which I think was a very fun and, you know, strong female power type episode. Yeah, girls? Yeah! All right. So now, because we've had that moment, we have to have this moment. CPU is produced by Backpacker Productions, run by yours truly, the Chief Cash Potato, and hails from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Please, if you like what you hear, take the time to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or Google Play. Give us some stars, a comment, a review, tell us what you think, sing our praises, or not, but be nice about it. We'll fix it. If you have suggestions on shows we might consider, contact us at our website, couchpotatoesunite.wordpress.com, via email at couchpotatoesunitepodcast at gmail.com, or via social media, Facebook and Twitter, though we add new and old shows to chat about around the water cooler all the time. Of course, we have several more new episodes coming down the pike. I said them in the intro. They're always available and searchable via the web. The ones we've done, the ones we will do, we're everywhere. Make sure you subscribe to our blog, our channels, and social media. Stay up on new events and episodes. Until that time, until our next episode, I have mentioned that Agent Carter is only available for purchase via DVD or via streaming like Amazon.com and is not available to stream right now. So we hope you will find it and watch it, but you do so on your own expense. (laughs) Sorry. Until our next episode, though, keep listening, keep watching, stay tuned. Bye-bye.